Indeed. Very good. Well, without a doubt, you know, if you've read the book of Revelation any at all, that those first three chapters, John was told to write to the seven churches in Asia. And so John has been a good witness, a good faithful recorder. And so he recorded for us what happened to him. He told us in chapter 1 how he was on the Isle of Patmos. And sure enough, all of a sudden, uh, the Lord spoke. He was behind him. He turns around, and there's the Lord standing. Uh, he knew that he was supposed to be sitting at the right hand of the Father, but it's interesting how many times we see him standing. And it seems to be because, like John saw him in his priestly garb, that he's busy being the high priest he's supposed to be. Now, he's come, there's coming a day he's going to be sitting. That's why those promises to the overcomer and getting to sit with him in, in his throne is an awesome opportunity. But when is Jesus going to sit? <laughs> well, of course he'll sit when he reigns. <laughs> so it's very interesting what John had to say. And he said when the, to the Lord talked to him, he said that Jesus, when he talked to him, that that voice was like... Uh, a, a, a voice of a trumpet. Amen? He said it was a voice that was like a voice of a trumpet. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 10, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a vo great voice as of a trumpet. So it definitely, wow, spooked him. It caught him off guard because all of a sudden <laughs> he thinks he's just in this little old prison cave and whoa, the Lord's speaking to him. And he gets to see the Lord. And, of course, we saw that in chapter 1. And so he says, after this I looked. After the Lord gives me these seven messages to give to these seven churches, and he has me start writing this stuff down. I'm writing it down. And I write these things to these seven churches. What the Spirit saith in the churches, he that hath an ear to hear, let him hear. Then, after this I looked, and behold, a door was open in heaven. So he's able to glance out that cave and look up in the sky and look, lo and behold, there's a door open. That had to be awesome. <laughs> I'm going to show you that picture Dr. Ruckman drew. You know, that's what's so cool. I got Dr. Ruckman's slide presentation of the book of Revelation that he drew, and I'm going to hook that up probably today and be ready to show it to you next Sunday. Amen. Just, just to think what it must have been like to look up there and see a door open in heaven. You know, some kind of, it wasn't a, uh, it wasn't just some kind of portal, amen. Uh, it was a door. And there, sure enough, it was open. And so he describes it here. I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither. So now all of a sudden, the Lord's behind that door, and he hollers out, Come up hither to John. And so just like he was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I told you how I think that just meant he was in the Spirit, because it was, it was just, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing to know when you're in the Spirit when you're not in the Spirit. <laughs> you can be in the flesh, but it's better to be in the Spirit. Amen. And to be yielded to the Spirit and be a spiritual man and not a carnal man. And certainly when Philip was whisked away by the Holy Spirit and was taken out to the desert to win that Ethiopian eunuch to the Lord, and then he was whisked away by the Holy Spirit and uh, moved on to preach that great revival. Uh, so he says that this door was open. There's the Lord Jesus talking to me with that voice like a trumpet. And he says, come up hither. Now what a beautiful picture that John here is being transported out of this dimension and out of our world and taken straight up to the third heaven, to a real physical door up there in heaven. He sees this door open. The Lord calls him to come up hither. I will show thee things which must be hereafter, because he was told to write the things that would be, amen, 119, write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. So he wrote the things uh, that had happened, how he had been in jail. Then he wrote the things uh, 
which are, and he told us how God wants these seven messages to these seven churches, so he wrote that. But now, and the whole rest of the book is going to deal with even further things, more things in the future, when someday, finally, Jesus reveals himself once again to the whole world. That's why it's called the book of Revelation. See, The Lord Jesus is going to be coming back someday on a white horse and reveal himself. But there's going to be judgments. This world's going to go through seven years of hell on earth. And uh, the Lord has given us this pr prophecy so that we can know when his revelation is coming and how soon it will be and know how far away we are from it. And it's closer today than it's ever been. And so, the Lord Jesus tells him, "Come up hither." Now, what a great insight! What must it going to be like? What must it be going to be like when the Lord raptures His church out of the world? It's got to be like this. It makes total sense that it would be similar to this. Amen. Because Paul talks so much to us, and since he's the apostle to the Gentiles, we better pay attention to what Paul had to say about this simple truth that, yes, Jesus is going to come back and take his church out of this world someday. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians 4 and remind ourselves what he wrote to this church at Thess Thessalonica and how he told them about this simple truth. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. But I would not have you to be ignorant brethren. That's good to know. God doesn't want you to be a dummy forever. See, this is what's so much. That's what's so wrong with the average, quote unquote, evangelical Christian church today. Uh, they have edified evangelism to the, to the point that uh, they neglect the edification and discipleship of the believer. I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren. We could preach on that for a week. <laughs> Concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. Now, of course, if someone's died and, and nobody knows the Lord, there's a lot of reason to weep. Because they're going to be missed, and you'll probably never see them again. Because there are no friends in hell. Someone said that the party was canceled due to the fire. Amen? So the Bible is very clear in the book of Job. It says that there's no relation in hell. Everyone in hell is your enemy. You won't even know your own family in hell. The book of Job is clear about that. Sorrow not as even as others have no hope. Now, if you're saved, though, and someone's died, well, we are going to miss them. But now we have some hope. We'll see them again. Amen. Amen. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and that is the requirement. You can't be a believer unless you believe that. You're not even you're not even you're not even a saint yet. You can't even go to heaven yet. You can't even have your sins forgiven or know what it means to have your sins forgiven if you don't know that Jesus died and rose again and believe that. If we believe Jesus died and rose again, even so, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. So Jesus is going to come again someday, and He's going to bring our dead loved ones with Him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. So Paul is making it clear. This is Bible. He says this is what Jesus taught. Now just because you don't know where the verses are, don't mean that there's a problem. Amen. <laughs> when you've got a problem with the Bible, you are the problem. All right? It's never the Bible. And then he gets into details for us. So praise the Lord, even though our loved ones are asleep. In Jesus, the Bible never refers to the body as dead. The Bible always referred to the body of a saint when they're passed on as, a, as sleeping. And just like when you sleep. You know, when you sleep, somebody looks at your eyelids, your eyeballs are moving around underneath them eyelids. Because why? Because truth is you're still conscious and you're dreaming, you know. A lot of the feelings you go through during the day... Well, your brain's trying to put that together for you when you sleep, so it puts together 
goofy things to try to remind you of all these feelings you had during the day. And uh, a lot of dream interpretation can just go to the simple fact that, well, what is the feeling you get there when you go through? Well, that's what your mind's trying to remind you of. But the Bible says, yes, the multitude of your business during the day is what your dreams are composed of. It's what you see a lot. Just like whenever uh, Nebuchadnezzar had gone through conquering Egypt and all this, so he comes home, he has this dream, God gives him this crazy dream about this giant image and stuff because he'd seen all these images in Egypt. It makes perfect sense. Uh, and yet the Lord was telling him the future and had Daniel come and interpret his dream for him and set him straight. So the Bible tells us, yes, thank God. Our, our loved ones are asleep in the Lord now, and the, but he's coming back, and we're not going to go to heaven before they, of course, are already in heaven, and they're not, uh, we're not going to be raptured out of here before they are physically raised out of here first. And he says, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. Meaning we're not vented out of here before they are. Prevent. See that? See, we're not escaping here before they escape first. So they're going to come back with Jesus in the clouds, the spirits, the souls of our loved ones, because their body's still in the ground. Verse 16, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. Now Jesus is going to descend out of the clouds. He's going to descend from heaven, and he's going to shout something. What's Jesus going to shout? Well, it would make total sense if he called to John, and told him when he was sitting there in the Isle of Patmos in a little cave of a jail cell, and I've been, I've stood right there in that jail cell, and if he looked and to see that door up there in heaven, and he heard Jesus' voice holler to him, come up hither, and boom, he's definitely in the spirit. He wasn't like Paul who said in 1 Corinthians 12, 2 Corinthians 12, in the spirit, out of the spirit, I could not tell. <laughs> in his flesh, out of flesh, he couldn't tell. Oh, no, he could tell. John knew he was definitely in the spirit. <laughs> Listen, you ain't going to be transported to heaven and not be there in the spirit. Amen. <laughs> he knew he was in the spirit, buddy. He definitely wasn't up there in the flesh. Though he physically could be transported there, absolutely, because that's no big deal for God. Just as sure as he could take Enoch, he was, was not, and the Lord took him. Amen. Enoch's never been found to this day. Why not? Because the Lord took him. You know, there's cosmonauts and astronauts and was nots. Amen. And someday I plan to be a was not. Amen. So the Bible says, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. And I believe he'll probably, because we got Revelation 4 to say so, that we'll probably hear our name. Remember when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead? He didn't just say, come forth, did he? Because if he did, every dead person in the world would have jumped out. No, no, no. He said, Lazarus, come forth. <laughs> and I believe God is able, in the moment in the twinkling of an eye, to say, Dan Harden, come up, for, uh, you know, come up hither. Dave Vickers come up hither. Amen. He's able. That's not a big deal to God. I'll hear my name. I'll hear him say, come up hither. He'll say, Brother Jeremy. He'll say, DJ. He'll, say, he'll, he'll call your name. Because he's God. And it's going to be awesome. Amen. The Lord himself shall descend with a shout. And then, and with the voice of the archangel. Then Michael the archangel holler something. Now, again, he's probably saying something, because guess what? Guess who's going to be getting ready now? Guess who's going to have to prove themselves, unlike any other time in all history? Israel. <laughs> Amen. And with the trump of God. So, wow, there's going to be a trump. That's the noise a trumpet makes. There's some kind of a trumpet noise going off there. So the Lord descends from heaven with a shout. Then there's a voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and then, whack, all of our dead loved ones that we can't see, because spirit, you know, in the spirit world, they're soul and spirit, they're with Jesus. Now Jesus comes in, into the sky, in, in the clouds, and he sends them down to this earth, and then they'll get down right there where we planted them in their graves. God is able to assemble their molecular structure that just as sure as God had Elisha, that old man had done turned the bones. So, I mean, he'd done been dead a long time. And the Israelites were burying one of their buddies, and they just said, well, man, we got these Midianites around. We better do something with his body. Let's just throw him in there, that old preacher's uh, 
sepulcher there. We'll just throw him in there until they pass, until they get out of here. Then we can go ahead and bury our buddy. And they threw him in there, and what happened? The Bible says as soon as that dead buddy touched the bones of Elisha the prophet, he come back to life. Because even that old bones and flesh, somehow, because it had the Spirit of the Lord in it and with it at one time, and with Elisha, it still had a life-giving principle to it. Though he was long dead. So the Lord knows how to assemble our bodies back together. It's no big deal for God. Somebody's been blown to bits in the ocean. Some people were killed in war and blown to bits. People said, man, we can't even find them. Well, don't worry. The Lord knows where they are. Amen. The Lord knows every ant that carried every piece and stored it away underneath the ground. <laughs> it's no big deal for God. God knows where every particle is and what fish swallowed him. Amen. God knows where it is. It's no big deal for God. He can put it all back together. And the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. So see, God loves you so much and thinks so much of you so much that he knows how much you loved your grandma and grandpa and uh, your Christian friends that you're going to get to see them before you even get to see Jesus if you're alive at that time. Amen. Amen. To meet the Lord in the earth, so shall we ever be the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Now, these words should be a comfort to you. Now, I find there's a bunch of clowns that say, I want to go through the tribulation. I want to. They don't find comfort in these words. That's right. I do remember the secret. That's right. It is with the righteous. It's not with everybody. And, you know, everybody can talk, talk about Bible. But a lot of people are just con and a con. I'm not more saved than the man in the moon. And then he said, but of the times and the seasons, brother, you have no need. I write unto you for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child. And they shall not escape. And, of course, the biggest thing going at this time when Paul wrote this was the Roman soldiers would say, peace and safety. Peace and safety. This was how the Roman soldiers saluted one another. Peace and safety. When they shall say peace and safety, we're bringing in a new world order. We're going to sign everybody up for free insurance. <laughs> peace and safety. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Or let's, let me say that you're not, we're not supposed to be, okay? <laughs> Again, the modern evangelical church says, Oh, yeah, we're secret friendly. Come on in. Hey, you want Bozo the Clown? We got him. Sit on Santa Claus' lap. Tell him what you want for Christmas. What's the big deal? Sure, I'm celebrating Halloween. You just name it. We'll give you whatever you want. Come on in here. See, it used to be the world, church had some influence on the world, but today the world has all the influence on the church. It's just the opposite. Because we've forgotten that we're not, the church is not supposed to be a man pleaser. But that verse ain't in their Bible. That's why they rewrote it. Ye are the children of light and children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night. And they that be drunken are drunken in the night. See, it's quite obvious from where they're, where they're coming from. Of course they're drunk. Of course, because they're, they're in the night. I heard Bob Doofus talking about, bragging about how he believes in liquor again. How he thinks it's totally okay to drink liquor. What an idiot. Amen. He's definitely not of the light. Amen. He's proving he's of the darkness. And yet he says, but the Bible says don't be drunk. Yeah, well, guess what, Bob? That only happens if you don't drink liquor. Woo but see, something happened to his brain quicker. Amen. Let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. So I love how Paul called this rapture here in verse 3 of chapter 5 an escape. And Jesus called it an escape because that's the key. 
people say, I don't see the word rapture in the Bible. Yeah, it's not in the Bible, but it is a theological term because, but the Bible word would be escape. Yeah, amen. Hallelujah. And God's cause has given us an opportunity to escape. Just like he called John out, someday the church will be called out. And John was what was it? He's of the 12 disciples. He's the last one. God used him to write and put the Bible together and put it together in the right order so that we have it just perfectly the way it should be. And so the Bible tells us here how Jesus is going to come and he's going to descend in the clouds. Amen. The Song of Solomon. Let's go over to the Song of Solomon. See if the Bible does teach this crazy doctrine or not. A lot of people today want to say this by this is not in the Bible. Are you nuts? How did Enoch get to heaven? He was walking with the Lord one evening. And uh, the Lord said, hey, it's closer to my house than it is your house. Well, i got to get home. My wife's fixing supper. He said, why don't you just come to my house? And nobody's seen him since. He was not for the Lord took him. See, God's been rapturing people throughout the whole Bible. That's not a big deal for God. Rapture's found all over this Bible. What do you think the resurrection of the dead are? If it's not some kind of a rapture, and that's what we're reading about here when he comes back and what it's going to be like. And so it says in the Song of Solomon, chapter 2, let's see what it is here, how the Lord refers to his church as the beloved. Song of Solomon 2, 8, The voice of my beloved, behold, he cometh leaping upon the mountains, skipping upon the hills. Amen. Zephaniah says he's singing a song. He's carrying his lambs and he's singing a song. I bet it's a love song, too. My beloved is like a roe or a heart, or a young heart. Behold, he standeth behind our wall. He looketh forth at the windows. Amen. He's standing behind our walls of indifference. Amen. <laughs> he looketh forth at the windows. Amen. He's looking through the windows of the heart, and he sees the sin in our lives, and he is not pleased. <laughs> Amen. Showing himself through the lattice. And I love that because John, in a few minutes, is going to describe, describe Jesus and how he's there uh, upon the throne, and how that there's a rainbow around the throne. And it's so fascinating to me that in physics, we've learned that the breakdown of water is called a lattice. Amen. You know, you ever notice how when the sun shines against some glass, and for sure when the sun's shining and there's some rain, that water is refracted through that rain, and you see a rainbow? That breakdown of that wa that light from just solid light white to the seven colors of the rainbow, that's called a lattice. And Jesus is able to look through that rainbow, buddy, right through the lattice. And he's watching. See, you can't see him. But he can see you. But if that door is heaven, and that door that John said he saw there in heaven, when that door is closed, you can't see where heaven's at. But one of these days it's going to open. <laughs> Amen. And the Lord's coming through that door. Amen. And so he's watching. He's watching us, but he's watching us. Now, lattice work. What is lattice? You can go to, did you know you can go to Lowe's and buy lattice? Amen. Many times we put it underneath these our porches. What is it? It's strips of wood. It's strips of wood where there's a space and a strip and a space and a strip. So that you can, anybody underneath the porch can look out and see you. That's a good hiding place. We used to play hide and seek. We love to go underneath the porch and look through the lattice work. And if it was real bright outside, you couldn't see underneath that dark porch who was hiding under the porch. <laughs> and so hes we can't seem to see him, but he sees us. He's hiding himself behind the lattice work. Amen. My beloved spake and said unto me, rise up. See, rise up. Wait, wait. That sounds like John. John, Revelation chapter 4. Come up hither. Amen. That sounds like 1 Thessalonians 4. Didn't it say the Lord's going to speak? Amen. The dead in Christ are going to rise first, and we we're alive. We're going to be caught up with him. Amen. There's some rising up going on. Amen. Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. Now, notice these tears, of, these, these terms of endearment. This is what's so awesome. Um, uh, how he's calling his church here as his beloved. Amen. Then he says this, look, so he cometh, he stands, he looks, he reveals himself, he speaks. For lo, the winter's past. See what he said? The rain is over and gone. Yeah, rain, uh, winter is a picture of death, amen? John 5, 24. 
reigns, a picture of judgment. John 3, 18. Lo, the winter's past, the rain is over and gone. The flowers appear on the earth. The time of singing of birds has come. See, it's a new day. Spring's in the air. Amen. Spring is here. Wherever he is, it's spring for me. <laughs> the flowers appear on the earth. The time of the singing of birds has come. And the voice of the turtle is heard. Now, is that talking about that little tarpon you run over once in a while? <laughs> Out in the middle of the street. No, no, no. He's talking about a snapping turtle or a little uh, turtle you buy at the store. He's talking about the turtle dove. See? You know, those turtle doves that kind of hang around the house sometimes, and they'll be cooing to each other, you know, and carrying on. But, boy, you get one that its mate dies, and then it's there crying the day it dies because it'll never mate again. And, of course, that's a beautiful picture of the Holy Spirit. The voice of the turtle is heard in the land. The Holy Spirit may be speaking, and it's not so audible to us, but he's still there, and he's still mourning for his true love. Amen. And the fig tree put forth her figs, her green figs. Oh, man, that almost sounds like Israel to me. <laughs> and the vines with the tender grape give a good smell. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. Amen. He's taking his church out of here. Amen. He's coming, and it's imminent. The fig leaf trees, the fig tree leaves are out. Amen. Harvest time is here. The reaper will soon be here. Come away. Don't delay. And so these terms are used. A fair one is only one. Ephesians four four calls this church is undefiled. Amen. First Corinthians twelve thirteen talks about how by one spirit were we all baptized in one body. Right. And of course the Bible speaks of him giving his. Life for his church, how he loves the church, gave himself for it, Ephesians chapter 5. Amen? And then, of course, how can we read the Song of Solomon without also jumping over to chapter 6, amen, where he says this, Song of Solomon chapter 6. Let's pick it up at verse 8. For there are three score queens and four, concub four score concubines and virgins without number. My dove, my undefiled, is but one, and she's the only one of her mother, and she's the choice one of her that bear her. The daughter saw her and blessed her, yea, the queens and the concubines, and they praised her. Who is she that looketh forth as the morning, fair as the moon, clear as the sun, and terrible as an army with banners? I went down into the garden of nuts to see the fruits of the valley and to see whether the vine flourish flourisheth, and the pomegranates budded, or ever I was where my soul made me like the chariots of Aminadib. Return, return, O Shulamite. Return, return, that we may look upon thee. What will we ye see in the Shulamite? As it were, the company of two armies. See, amen. His beloved is precious to him, and she's a great woman among all these other women. And her, uh, we see her bridesmaids and so forth so on. But yet, return to me, and yet her company is two armies. Again, because see, we're going up to heaven, but yet when he comes back with us, we've come from one being one army to becoming two armies, because when he comes back, guess who comes back with us? Well, of course, the Old Testament saints come back with us too. Because, again, he's setting up that kingdom on the earth. So it's going to be wonderful. He leaves with the one army that is his bride, but he comes back with two armies because, of course, he's got that the Old Testament saints with him too. He's got that church in the wilderness that Stephen talked about in the book of Acts. Amen? Now, it's interesting that the Bible speaks of, even in the book of Acts, chapter 1, when the Lord Jesus left and all of a sudden he was received out of their sight into those clouds, and them angels said, hey, he's been a Galilee, the same Jesus coming back like you've seen him go. Amen? Amen. There's a song the girls sing, lift up your head, your redemption draweth nigh. Because, amen, he's coming out of the clouds. Amen. Hallelujah. So he's going to descend, it said, and he, the Lord's going to shout something. Now, again, I think he'll probably shout our name. Amen? To me, it just makes sense, John chapter 10. Let's look at John chapter 10 and verse 3. 
Jesus said, Yes, to him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. If Jesus is the shepherd, and we're his sheep, wouldn't he call us by name? Amen. Ed Krause, come up hither. Keith Young, come up hither. Man, whew. one of these days I'm leaving like Superman and coming back like the Lone Ranger. Amen. I'm looking forward to that. And he'll not only call our, he'll call our name, but he'll call us away like he did John there in John chapter 4. Amen. So he descends. And then we see that his voice, he's going to shout something. Does the Bible back this up? Let's go to Job. Let's go to the book of Job now. Well, the oldest the oldest book in the whole Bible is the book of Job. First book ever written in the Bible is the book of Job. Men have read Job, read Job more than all the other parts of the Bible. So let's take a look here at what Job had to say in Job 36. In verse 32. With clouds he covereth the light, and commandeth it not to shine by the cloud that cometh betwixt. The noise thereof showeth concerning it, the cattle also concerning the vapor. At this also my heart trembleth, and is moved out of his place. What's going to move my heart out of its place? Hear attentively the noise of his voice, and the sound that goeth out of his mouth. He directeth it under the whole heaven, and is lightning. Lightning? Yes, lightning, you know, that appears out of the west and goes to the east. <laughs> Amen. Luke 17, 24, amen? His lightning under the ends of the earth. When Jesus comes back, brother, he's coming back in the clouds, and he'll go like lightning from one end of this world to the other. Amen? And he'll be calling up his saints. Now, again, this lightning is an interesting thing. According to the physics, when we see lightning, you see what electrically has been caught up into a tunnel of negative dust particles, and it sucks up the positive particles. And that friction between that positive and that negative is what you see as a flash of light and fire. God thunders marvelously with his voice. Well, I'm getting ahead of myself. Verse 11. He directs it under the whole heaven and is, is lightning under the ends of the earth. After it, what? The it, the lightning. After it a voice roareth, he thundereth with his voice of his excellency, and he will not stay them when his voice is heard. My earliest recollection is a little boy living at the little house at 20, 2170 uh, College Street in Lincoln Park, Michigan, is hearing the thunder, and my mom saying, shh, 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 listening to thunder. Why have we got to be quiet when there's a flash of lightning? And we're always listening at the thunder. Well, of course, later you learn, well, it's traveling at so many feet per second. And if you can count it, you know how far away it was. Of course, I found that out much later, amen. But my earliest recollection is sitting there in that living room, even with my grandma when my parents weren't around. And she's babysitting me. And then there comes a storm. And they'd say, shh, 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 let's listen. There'd be lightning. Then we'd be listening. Then we'd hear the thunder. And I think, man, what is this thing, man? We turn all the TV off. We sit there in the dark. And we listen to the thunder. Well, I believe we're listening for a voice. I believe that my folks were teaching me something that I didn't know. That one of these days there's going to be lightning, and then after that lightning there's going to be a voice that roareth. He thundereth with the voice of his excellency, and he will not stay. Look at it. He will not stay them when his voice is heard. Somebody's leaving. <laughs> Amen? I'm planning to be one of them. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm looking forward to that day. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. God thundereth marvelously with his voice. Amen. John 10, he knows his sheep. He calls them by name. And they know his voice. See? See, some of them don't know his voice. Some of them can't be comforted by these words. God thundereth marvelously with his voice. Great things doeth he which we cannot comprehend. Yeah, that, that matches. <laughs> that, this is a proof text, Amen. For the fact that God is going to send Jesus to rapture us out of here someday. And it's going to be a glorious thing. Because again, we're in a moment, it's twinkling of an eye, our bodies are going to be changed. Amen. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Look at John chapter 12. John chapter 12.
let's take a look at um, 28. Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it, will glorify it again. The people, therefore, that stood by and heard it said that it thundered. See, they, they don't understand God's words. They can't understand God's voice. See, they're not God's chosen. See, they, The secret of the Lord ain't, but with the righteous, and these people that aren't righteous, they just think it thunders. But the people who knew what who knew the Lord, they understood what the Lord what the Lord said. Amen. Others said an angel spake to him. <laughs> Jesus answered and said, This voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. See? See there? See, Jesus is trying to teach us something if we're listening. So he said, even the archangel is going to say something. Jude 9, Daniel 12, 1. Uh, he talks about the trump. We've talked about Numbers 10 before in Exodus 19, where the Bible says that, yes, they would have two silver trumpets. Moses made two silver trumpets. They'd sound the one to assemble, then the others would sound, and they'd leave. One to assemble, one to leave. That's why there's two trumps. The first trump sounds, the dead rise, then the second, see, that's called assembly. Second trump moves, we move. Second trump goes, we move. And then it says his dead arise, amen. Hallelujah. The dead in Christ shall rise first. Amen. Now, 20, Isaiah 26 speaks of these things, amen. This is an Old Testament verse that all the Jews knew, and they knew that based on this verse, there's going to be physically a resurrection. Of course, now, if you were a modern Jew and you were a Sadducee, you didn't believe in a little resurrection. But the Pharisees and the fundamental Jews did believe in a resurrection because this verse in Isaiah 26. Verse 19. Thy dead men shall live together with my dead body, shall they arise. Awake and sing, ye that dwell in dust, for thy dew is as the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. Come, my people, enter thou into thy chambers, and shut thy doors about thee. Hide thyself, as it were, for a little moment, until the indignation be overpassed. For behold, the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth also shall disclose her blood, and shall no more cover her slain. So hallelujah, we're going to rise out of here someday, and we can look forward to it. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 15, remind ourselves what Paul said there about how that, yes, we have a physical body that just like a corn plant. It's got a little corn seed, and it's got a hull on the outside of it, or a shell, and it's got a life principle on the inside. So we know that someday we got to drop. This old body's going to drop someday. We are in an old carnal, fleshy body, and it's going to drop someday. The wages of sin is still death. And we're going to have to drop this old robe of flesh someday, but thank God, someday it's going to be raised too. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, it's going to pop out of the ground. And so in 1 Corinthians 15, he says this, Behold, verse 51, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. Some people will actually be alive when the Lord comes back. To rapture the church out of here. That word rapture is, means to, to snatch and, and grab a hold of and take off with. And that's a perfect example of what the Lord Jesus is doing. He's coming back and he's snatching us as church out of here. Because like he said, we're not appointed to wrath. And in uh, Revelation 15.1, Revelation 16.1, both those verses tell you that this seven years of the, the tribulation is the wrath of God. God's pouring it out on the world. Behold, I show you, mystery, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. So when this takes place, it's going to happen so quick. At the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, the dead in Christ shall rise be raised incorruptible, we shall be changed. This corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. Now, what is the twinkling of an eye? Some people say, like the new perverted versions, some of them say in the wink of an eye. No, 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 the wink of an eye is too slow. 
you know, you might be able to be a, you might be a quick winker. The Bible tells you to watch out for somebody always winking with their eyes too. <laughs> but no, the twinkling of an eye is how how fast your eye can focus. You know, I'm looking at Brother Ron Petrie one second. I can look at Brother Don the next. I can look at Brother Petrie one second and look at Brother Doug the next. That quick, as quick as your eye can focus from one point to the other, that's a twinkling of an eye. People say, well, preacher, when I see something happen, then I'll get on my knees and ask Jesus to save me. Say, no, you won't, fool, because believe me, it's going to happen so quick, you ain't going to have time to ask God to save you and get re and, and repent and leave with me. If you ain't done it before, you ain't going to do it. What are you waiting for? That's why we wrote the track. What are you waiting for? You can't be waiting around here. Say, well, when I see, then I'll... No, you won't, fool. You better get it right, right now while you can. Amen? In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound. The dead shall be raised incorruptible. We shall be chained. For this corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal shall put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall put on incorruption, this mortal shall put on immortality. Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Amen. Isaiah 25, 8, see? Everything's according to the Scripture. God had these little slivers of promises throughout the Old Testament, and it's going to all take place sometime real soon here in the New Testament. O death, where's thy sting? O grave, where's thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, as for as much as you know your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So that's why we want to keep on keeping on for Jesus. If you're doing something and you're living and your life's work is all about Jesus, hallelujah, it's not going to be in vain. And this world might weep and say you were a pauper, but you'll be rich in heaven. And that's where it really counts. <laughs> Hallelujah. So when the book of Revelation starts with John writing these first three chapters, and what a coincidence, they just happen to be three chapters. And, of course, he's definitely dealing with these seven churches in Asia. Then all of a sudden, chapter 4, all of a sudden, boom, a door is open in heaven. And he hears the Lord's voice telling him, come up hither. I'll show you things which must be hereafter. And immediately he's eyes, eyes in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven. So he's taken to heaven. He's taken up there like Paul said he was, to the third heaven, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And so he sees the same stuff Paul saw, but Paul wasn't allowed to tell us. Paul said, I saw things, but it's unlawful for me to tell. I can't tell nobody. The Lord told me not to tell, so I couldn't tell. But he saw what John saw, and of course, so John got to write it down for us. So praise the Lord. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. So he sees this. Now, what's interesting is here we see John going up after three chapters where he's dealing with these seven churches in Asia. Then he's taken up. Well, see, that's a beautiful picture. How we're part of God's church age still today, and there's coming at the end of this age. Boom, he's going to rapture us out of here. And then we see what God's going to do for seven years of hell on earth. The earth's going to go through all this. So he likes the seven seals, seven trumpets, seven vials, and uh, tells us what all he sees going on up there. And then finally at the end, go to chapter 19 now. Then in 19, this door that was open, the Bible doesn't talk about the door anymore, but it does say this in chapter 19 uh, that kind of matches this idea of a door. It says in 1911, And I saw heaven opened. And behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true and in righteousness, he that judged and make war. So John goes up, 4 verse 1, and then 19, verse 11, Jesus comes out and comes down. So it would be, it would be logical to, to presume that, well, see, that must be that same door. Even though the Bible doesn't say it's a door, just as heaven was open, amen. So it's neat to think that, wow, there's three chapters, then somebody goes up through a door in heaven, then Jesus comes down in 1911, and then there's three more chapters, 20, 21, 22, and then the book's done. What a perfect symmetry, what a perfect outline, what perfect balance 
there is to this book of Revelation, that someone would go up, so, and then we've got all these chapters where this seven years of hell on earth are discussed at least three separate times, and then, boom, Jesus comes down, and then it ends with three more chapters, and then it's over. So again, that's showing that somebody besides John wrote the book of Revelation. <laughs> it must be the inspired Word of God, and the Holy Spirit had something to do with preserving His words, amen? And it being the actual inspired words of God, it makes total sense because everyone can tell you, now wait a minute, the original didn't have any chapter, chapter and verse markings in it. It didn't? <laughs> no, a guy named Stevens, uh, he added that during the Reformation in the 1500s. He's riding a horse. He's running from one city to the next so the Pope wouldn't catch him. And so uh, he, he made those. And one day, you know, the horse tripped, and so he made a mark right there, and there's been a mark there ever since. And, uh, and they say, oh, uh, that couldn't be inspired. Are you nuts? Sure it can. God can have everything perfect because it's his words. God can preserve his words. Amen. So we've got it today, and it makes total sense. Even the chapter and verse markings, even the number sevens in the Bible, and the number fours, and the number threes, and the number sixes. <laughs> and we look at it and say, whoa, man, this must be God's book, and it is. Go read Harry Potter. You want to read some trash? Waste your time. There's nothing inspired in that. This is God's inspired word. I bet you could take Harry Potter in a hospital, walk around, nobody even give a flip. But believe me, you walk in a hospital with this book under your arm just like this, I've watched nurses back up against the wall, scared to death of it, just looking at it, just crazy. Not, what's wrong with you? It's just a book. And I watched them run out as quick as they got to their floor. Because this is God's book. This is supernatural. And these devils possess crazy, you know, and Satan worshipers and dope heads, man. They don't even know it. You know, sort of like, again, you know, it's like when I, my car's broke down, I walk in the nearest bar and use the phone back before we had cell phones. And everybody at that bar would turn and look at me. Well, what are they looking at me for? You know, if I had to wait on a tow truck, you know, I might get me a Coca-Cola, sit in the corner and watch everybody there. I watch other people come in and they wouldn't look at them. Somehow they knew I shouldn't have been in there. <laughs> Their spirit bore witness with my spirit that, I belong to the Lord, and they didn't. You know what I mean? It's great to, to know the Lord, amen, and, uh, and to be in the Spirit on the Lord's day, amen. Let's all stand by our heads in prayer. Father, we're thankful for your word. God, help us to get a hold of these truths. That, yeah, you're coming soon. Man, come quickly, Lord Jesus. We're looking forward to it. We can't wait, Lord, to hear that trump and know that our loved ones are going to be raised up incorruptible, and then we're going to be changed. A moment, Twinkling and I get to fly out of here with them. And... Um, Boy, it'd be great to see him again. It's going to be exciting. And then to be flying through the air, to go uh, to forever to be with the Lord. Man, we're looking forward to that. To finally being with Jesus, the one who bought us with his own blood. Certainly, uh, he's worthy of the reward of his suffering, all that he went through for his church. Lord, help us to be a holy church, a clean church, one without spot or wrinkle like you told us. Forgive us, Lord, for our sins and shortcomings, how we listen too much to the world, the flesh, and the devil. Help us to try to grow the inner man, that spiritual man, to stay in the Word of God, to only allow the music that songs, and psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to grow in our soul and spirit to be clean and so that when we do witness to people, there's the power of God there and makes a difference. They see the difference. So, because they'll want that difference so we can see more men, women, boys and girls that'll say, tell me how to be saved I want to go to heaven too again Lord forgive us for where we fail you help us to be everything you've called us to be today in Jesus name we ask it, amen what page you got now? page 3 Jesus paid it all, don't you think you owe it all to him my friend I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Out of weakness watch and pray, You'll find in me thy knowledge all. Jesus.
this made it all in my life. Sin had left the and He was as white as snow. For now, indeed, I find I are in my and change the leper spots and melt the heart of stone. Jesus paid it all to him, my God. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. For nothing could have been. Wash my garments white in the blood of Calvary's land. Jesus paid it all to him, my own. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. And when before the throne I stand in him Jesus died my soul to save, my lips shall still be me. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. some stay. Amen. All right, we're going to have prayer, and then after we have prayer, you guys can get in line, get you some food. But we're going to have all the men come up here. And Brother DJ mentioned he's got uh, his baby. He wants us to pray over it because he's had some physical problems there. So we're going to anoint it with oil and uh, have a prayer with it up here after uh, we're dismissed for lunch, okay? So, Brother Abraham, why don't you go ahead and pray for us, and we'll be dismissed.